a new synthesis of scientific knowledge has emerged and continues to flourish. In recent years, the answers to questions about our cosmic origins have not come solely from the domain of astrophysics. Working under the umbrella of emergent fields with names such as astrochemistry, astrobiology, and astroparticle physics, astrophysicists have recognized that they can benefit greatly from the collaborative infusion of other sciences. To invoke multiple branches of science when answering the question, where did we come from, empowers investigators with a previously unimagined breadth and depth of insight into how the universe works. In Origins, 14 billion years of cosmic evolution, we introduce the reader to this new synthesis of knowledge, which allows us to address not only the origin of the universe, but also the origin of the largest structures that matter has formed, the origin of the stars that light the cosmos, the origin of planets that offer the likeliest sites for life, and the origin of life itself on one or more of those planets. Humans remain fascinated with the topic of origins for many reasons, both logical and emotional. We can hardly comprehend the essence of anything without knowing where it came from. And of all the stories that we hear, those that recount our own origins engender the deepest resonance within us. Self-centeredness, bred into our bones by our evolution and experience on Earth, has led us naturally to focus on local events and phenomena in the retelling of most origin stories. However, every advance in our knowledge of the cosmos has revealed that we live on a cosmic speck of dust, orbiting a mediocre star in the far suburbs of a common sort of galaxy among a hundred billion galaxies in the universe. The news of our cosmic unimportance triggers impressive defense mechanisms in the human psyche. Many of us unwittingly resemble the man in the cartoon who gazes at the starry heavens and remarks to his companion, When I look at all those stars, I'm struck by how insignificant they are. Throughout history, different cultures have produced creation myths that explain our origins as the result of cosmic forces shaping our destiny. These histories have helped us to ward off feelings of insignificance. Although origin stories typically begin with a big picture, they get down to Earth with impressive speed, zipping past the creation of the universe, of all its contents, and of life on Earth, to arrive at long explanations of myriad details of human history and its social conflicts, as if we somehow formed the center of creation. Almost all the disparate answers to the quest of origins accept as their underlying premise that the cosmos behaves in accordance with general rules, which reveal themselves, at least in principle, to our careful examination of the world around us. Ancient Greek philosophers raised this premise to exalted heights, insisting that we humans possess the power to perceive how nature operates, as well as the underlying reality beneath what we observe, the fundamental truths that govern all else. Quite understandably, they insisted that uncovering those truths would be difficult. 2,300 years ago, in his most famous reflection on our ignorance, the Greek philosopher Plato compared those who strive for knowledge to prisoners chained in a cave, unable to see objects behind them, and who must attempt to deduce from the shadows of these objects an accurate description of reality. With this simile, Plato not only summarized humanity's attempts to understand the cosmos, but also emphasized that we have a natural tendency to believe that mysterious, dimly sensed entities govern the universe, privy to knowledge that we can, at best, glimpse only in part. From Plato to Buddha, from Moses to Muhammad, from a hypothesized cosmic creator to modern films about the Matrix, humans in every culture have concluded that higher powers rule the cosmos, gifted with an understanding of the gulf between reality and superficial appearance. Half a millennium ago, a new approach toward understanding nature slowly took hold. This attitude, which we now call science, arose from the confluence of new technologies and the discoveries that they fostered. The spread of printed books across Europe, together with simultaneous improvements in travel by road and water, allowed individuals to communicate more quickly and effectively, so that they could learn what others had to say, and could respond far more rapidly than in the past. During the 16th and 17th centuries, this hastened back-and-forth disputation and led to a new way of acquiring knowledge based on the principle that the most effective means of understanding the cosmos relies on careful observations, coupled with attempts to specify broad and basic principles that explain a set of these observations. One more concept gave birth to science. Science depends on organized skepticism, 
that is, on continual methodical doubting. Few of us doubt our own conclusions, so science embraces its skeptical approach by rewarding those who doubt someone else's. We may rightly call this approach unnatural, not so much because it calls for mistrusting someone else's thoughts, but because science encourages and rewards those who can demonstrate that another scientist's conclusions are just plain wrong. To other scientists, the scientist who corrects a colleague's error or cites good reasons for seriously doubting his or her conclusions performs a noble deed, like a Zen master who boxes the ears of a novice straying from the meditative path. Although scientists correct one another more as equals than as master and student, by rewarding a scientist who spots another's errors, a task that human nature makes much easier than discerning one's own mistakes, scientists as a group have created an inborn system of self-correction. Scientists have collectively created our most efficient and effective tool for analyzing nature, because they seek to disprove other scientists' theories even as they support their earnest attempts to advance human knowledge. Science thus amounts to a collective pursuit, but a mutual admiration society it is not, nor was meant to be. Like all attempts at human progress, the scientific approach works better in theory than in practice. Not all scientists doubt one another as effectively as they should. The need to impress scientists who occupy powerful positions and who are sometimes swayed by factors that lie beyond their conscious knowledge can interfere with science's self-correcting ability. In the long run, however, errors cannot endure because other scientists will discover them and promote their own careers by trumpeting the news. Those conclusions that do survive the attacks of other scientists will eventually achieve the status of scientific laws, accepted as valid descriptions of reality, even though scientists understand that each of these laws may someday find itself to be only part of a larger, deeper truth. But scientists hardly spend all their time attempting to prove one another mistaken. Most scientific endeavors proceed by testing imperfectly established hypotheses against slightly improved observational results. Every once in a while, however, a significantly new take on an important theory emerges. Or, more often in an age of technological advances, a whole new range of observations opens the way to a new set of hypotheses to explain these new results. The greatest moments in scientific history have arisen and will always arise when a new explanation, perhaps coupled with new observational results, produces a seismic shift in our conclusions about the workings of nature. Scientific progress depends on individuals in both camps, those who assemble better data and extrapolate carefully from it, and those who risk much and have much to gain if successful by challenging widely accepted conclusions. Science's skeptical core makes it a poor competitor for human hearts and minds, which recoil from its ongoing controversies and prefer the security of seemingly eternal truths. If the scientific approach were just one more interpretation of the cosmos, it would never have amounted to much. But science's big-time success rests on the fact that it works. If you board an aircraft built according to science, with principles that have survived numerous attempts to prove them wrong, you have a far better chance of reaching your destination than you do in an aircraft constructed by the rules of Vedic astrology. Throughout relatively recent history, people confronted with the success of science in explaining natural phenomena have reacted in one of four ways. First, a small minority have embraced the scientific method as our best hope for understanding nature and seek no additional ways to comprehend the universe. Second, a much larger number ignore science, judging it uninteresting, opaque, or opposed to the human spirit. Those who watch television greedily without ever pausing to wonder where the pictures and sound come from remind us that the words magic and machine share deep etymological roots. Third, another minority, conscious of the assault that science seems to make upon their cherished beliefs, seek actively to disprove scientific results that annoy or enrage them. They do so, however, quite outside the skeptical framework of science, as you can easily establish by asking one of them what evidence would convince you that you were wrong. These anti-scientists still feel the shock that John Donne described in his poem The Anatomy of the World, The First Anniversary, written in 1611 as the first fruits of modern science appeared. A new philosophy calls all in doubt. The element of fire is quite put out, 
The sun is lost, and the earth and no man's wit can well direct him where to look for it. And freely, men confess that this world spent, when in the planets and the firmament they seek so many new. They see that this world is crumbled out again to its atomies. Tis all in pieces, all coherence gone. Fourth, another large section of the public accepts the scientific approach to nature while maintaining a belief in supernatural entities existing beyond our complete understanding that rule the cosmos. Baruch Spinoza, the philosopher who created the strongest bridge between the natural and the supernatural, rejected any distinction between nature and God, insisting instead that the cosmos is simultaneously nature and God. Adherents of more conventional religions, which typically insist on this distinction, often reconcile the two by mentally separating the domains in which the natural and the supernatural operate. No matter what camp you may live in, no one doubts that these are auspicious times for learning what's new in the cosmos. Let us then proceed with our adventurous quest for cosmic origins, acting much like detectives who deduce the facts of the crime from the evidence left behind. We invite you to join us in search of cosmic clues and the means of interpreting them so that together we may uncover the story of how part of the universe turned into ourselves. Overture The greatest story ever told. The world has persisted many a long year, having once been set going in the appropriate motions. From these, everything else follows. Lucretius Some 14 billion years ago, at the beginning of time, all the space and all the matter and all the energy of the known universe fit within a pinhead. The universe was then so hot that the basic forces of nature, which collectively describe the universe, were merged into a single unified force. When the universe was a roaring 10 to the 30th power degrees and just 10 to the negative 43rd power seconds old, the time before which all of our theories of matter and space lose their meaning, Black holes spontaneously formed, disappeared, and formed again out of the energy contained within the unified force field. Under these extreme conditions, in what is admittedly speculative physics, the structure of space and time became severely curved as it gurgled into a spongy, foam-like structure. During this epoch, phenomena described by Einstein's general theory of relativity, the modern theory of gravity, and quantum mechanics the description of matter on its smallest scales, were indistinguishable. As the universe expanded and cooled, gravity split from the other forces. Soon thereafter, the strong nuclear force and the electroweak force split from each other, an event accompanied by an enormous release of stored energy that induced a rapid 50 power of 10 increase in the size of the universe. The rapid expansion, known as the epoch of inflation, stretched and smoothed matter and energy so that any variation in density from one part of the universe to the next became less than one part in a hundred thousand. Continuing onward with what is now laboratory-confirmed physics, the universe was hot enough for photons to spontaneously convert their energy into matter-antimatter particle pairs, which immediately thereafter annihilated each other, returning their energy back to photons. For reasons unknown, this symmetry between matter and antimatter had been broken at the previous force splitting, which led to a slight excess of matter over antimatter. The asymmetry was small, but crucial for the future evolution of the universe. For every one billion antimatter particles, one billion plus one matter particles were born. As the universe continued to cool, the electroweak force split into the electromagnetic force and the weak nuclear force completing the four distinct and familiar forces of nature. While the energy of the photon bath continued to drop, pairs of matter-antimatter particles could no longer be created spontaneously from the available photons. All remaining pairs of matter-antimatter particles swiftly annihilated, leaving behind a universe with one particle of ordinary matter for every billion photons, and no antimatter. Had this matter over antimatter asymmetry not emerged, the expanding universe would forever be composed of light and nothing else, not even astrophysicists. Over a roughly three-minute period, the matter became protons and neutrons, 
many of which combined to become the simplest atomic nuclei. Meanwhile, free-roving electrons thoroughly scattered the photons to and fro, creating an opaque soup of matter and energy. When the universe cooled below a few thousand degrees Kelvin, somewhat hotter than a blast furnace, the loose electrons moved slowly enough to get snatched from the soup by the roving nuclei to make complete atoms of hydrogen, helium, and lithium, the three lightest elements. The universe had now become, for the first time, transparent to visible light, and these free-flying photons are observable today as the cosmic microwave background. During its first billion years, the universe continued to expand and cool as matter gravitated into the massive concentrations we call galaxies. Within just the volume of the cosmos that we can see, a hundred billion of these galaxies formed, each containing hundreds of billions of stars that undergo thermonuclear fusion in their cores. Those stars, with more than about ten times the mass of the sun, achieve sufficient pressure and temperature in their cores to manufacture dozens of elements heavier than hydrogen, including the elements that compose planets and the life upon them. These elements would be embarrassingly useless were they to remain locked inside the star. But high-mass stars explode in depth, scattering their chemically enriched guts throughout the galaxy. After seven or eight billion years of such enrichment, an undistinguished star, the Sun, was born in an undistinguished region, the Orion arm of an undistinguished galaxy, the Milky Way, in an undistinguished part of the universe, the outskirts of the Virgo supercluster. The gas cloud from which the Sun formed contained a sufficient supply of heavy elements to spawn a few planets, thousands of asteroids, and billions of comets. During the formation of this star system, matter condensed and accreted out of the parent cloud of gas while circling the Sun. For several hundred million years, the persistent impacts of high-velocity comets and other leftover debris rendered molten the surfaces of the rocky planets, preventing the formation of complex molecules. As less and less accretable matter remained in the solar system, the planet's surfaces began to cool. The planet we call Earth formed in an orbit where its atmosphere can sustain oceans, largely in liquid form. Had Earth formed much closer to the Sun, the oceans would have vaporized. Had Earth formed much farther, the oceans would have frozen. In either case, life as we know it would not have evolved. Within the chemically rich liquid oceans, by a mechanism unknown, simple anaerobic bacteria emerged that unwittingly transformed Earth's carbon dioxide rich atmosphere into one with sufficient oxygen to allow aerobic organisms to form, evolve, and dominate the oceans and land. These same oxygen atoms, normally found in pairs, O2, also combined in threes to form ozone, O3, in the upper atmosphere which shields the Earth's surface from most of the Sun's molecule-hostile ultraviolet photons. The remarkable diversity of life on Earth and, we may presume, elsewhere in the universe arises from the cosmic abundance of carbon and the countless numbers of molecules, simple and complex, made from it. More varieties of carbon-based molecules exist than of all other molecules combined. But life is fragile. Earth's encounters with large objects, left over from the formation of the solar system, which were once common events, still wreak intermittent havoc upon our ecosystem. A mere 65 million years ago, less than 2% of Earth's past, a 10 trillion ton asteroid struck what is now the Yucatan Peninsula and obliterated over 70% of Earth's land-based flora and fauna, including all the dinosaurs, the dominant land animals of that epoch. This ecological tragedy opened an opportunity for small, surviving mammals to fill freshly vacant niches. A big-brained branch of these mammals, one we call primates, evolved a genus and species, Homo sapiens, to a level of intelligence that enabled them to invent methods and tools of science, to invent astrophysics, and to deduce the origin and evolution of the universe. Yes, the universe had a beginning. Yes. The universe continues to evolve, and yes, every one of our body's atoms is traceable to the Big Bang and to the thermonuclear furnaces within high-mass stars. We are not simply in the universe. We are part of it. We are born from it. 
One might even say that the universe has empowered us, here in our small corner of the cosmos, to figure itself out. And we have only just begun. Part 1. The Origin of the Universe Chapter 1. In the Beginning In the beginning, there was physics. Physics describes how matter, energy, space, and time behave and interact with one another. The interplay of these characters in our cosmic drama underlies all biological and chemical phenomena. Hence, everything fundamental and familiar to us Earthlings begins with and rests upon the laws of physics. When we apply these laws to astronomical settings, we deal with physics writ large, which we call astrophysics. In almost any area of scientific inquiry, but especially in physics, the frontier of discovery lives at the extremes of our ability to measure events and situations. In an extreme of matter, such as the neighborhood of a black hole, gravity strongly warps the surrounding space-time continuum. At an extreme of energy, thermonuclear fusion sustains itself within the 15 million degree cores of stars, and at every extreme imaginable, we find the outrageously hot and dense conditions that prevailed during the first few moments of the universe. To understand what happens in each of these scenarios requires laws of physics discovered after 1900, during what physicists now call the modern era, to distinguish it from the classical era that includes all previous physics. One major feature of classical physics is that events and laws and predictions actually make sense when you stop and think about them. They were all discovered and tested in ordinary laboratories and ordinary buildings. The laws of gravity and motion, of electricity and magnetism, and of the nature and behavior of heat energy are still taught in high school physics classes. These revelations about the natural world fueled the Industrial Revolution itself transforming culture and society in ways unimagined by generations that came before and remain central to what happens and why in the world of everyday experience. By contrast, nothing makes sense in modern physics because everything happens in regimes that lie far beyond those to which our human senses respond. This is a good thing. We may happily report that our daily lives remain wholly devoid of extreme physics. On a normal morning, you get out of bed, wander around the house, eat something, then dash out the front door. At day's end, your loved ones fully expect you to look no different than you did when you left, and to return home in one piece. But imagine yourself arriving at the office, walking into an overheated conference room for an important 10 a.m. meeting, and suddenly losing all your electrons. Or worse yet, having every atom of your body fly apart. That would be bad. Suppose instead that you're sitting in your office trying to get some work done by the light of your 75-watt desk lamp when somebody flicks on 500 watts of overhead lights, causing your body to bounce randomly from wall to wall until you're jack in the box out the window. Or what if you go to a sumo wrestling match after work, only to see the two nearly spherical gentlemen collide, disappear, and then spontaneously become two beams of light that leave the room in opposite directions, or suppose that on your way home, you take a road less traveled, and a darkened building sucks you in feet first, stretching your body head to toe while squeezing you shoulder to shoulder as you get extruded through a hole, never to be seen or heard from again. If those scenes played themselves out in our daily lives, we would find modern physics far less bizarre. Our knowledge of the foundations of relativity and quantum mechanics would flow naturally from our life experiences and our loved ones would probably never let us go to work. But back in the early minutes of the universe, that kind of stuff happened all the time. To envision it, and to understand it, we have no choice but to establish a new form of common sense, an altered intuition about how matter behaves, and how physical laws describe its behavior, at extremes of temperature, density, and pressure. We must enter the world of E equals mc squared, Albert Einstein first published a version of this famous equation in 1905, the year in which his seminal research paper entitled Zurelektodynamik bei Vector Körper appeared in Anderlin der Physik, the preeminent German journal of physics. The paper's title in English reads On the Electrodynamics of Moving Bodies, but the work is far better known as Einstein's Special Theory of Relativity. 
which introduced concepts that forever changed our notions of space and time. Just 26 years old in 1905, working as a patent examiner in Bern, Switzerland, Einstein offered further details, including his best-known equation in another remarkably short two-and-a-half-page paper published later the same year in the same journal. Is the Trickheit eines Kupers von seinem einen Gegenhalt abhängig? Or, does the inertia of a body depend on its energy content? To save you the effort of locating the original article, of designing an experiment, and of thus testing Einstein's theory, the answer to the paper's title is yes. As Einstein wrote, If a body gives off the energy E in the form of radiation, its mass diminishes by E over C squared. The mass of a body is a measure of its energy content. If the energy changes by E, the mass changes in the same sense. Uncertain as to the truth of his statement, he then suggested, It is not impossible that with bodies whose energy content is variable to a high degree, e.g. with radium salts, the theory may be successfully put to the test. There you have it. The algebraic recipe for all occasions when you want to convert matter into energy or energy into matter. E equals mc squared. Energy equals mass times the square of the speed of light gives us a supremely powerful computational tool that extends our capacity to know and understand the universe from as it is now all the way back to infinitesimal fractions of a second after the birth of the cosmos. With this equation, you can tell how much radiant energy a star can produce or how much you could gain by converting the coins in your pocket into useful forms of energy. The most familiar form of energy shining all around us, though often unrecognized and unnamed in our mind's eye, is the photon a massless, irreducible particle of visible light, or of any other form of electromagnetic radiation. We all live within a continuous bath of photons, from the sun, the moon, and the stars, from your stove, your chandelier, and your nightlight, from hundreds of radio and television stations, and from countless cell phone and radar transmissions. Why then, don't we actually see the daily transmuting of energy into matter, or of matter into energy? The energy of common photons sits far below the mass of the least massive subatomic particles when converted into energy by E equals mc squared. Because these photons wield too little energy to become anything else, they lead simple, relatively uneventful lives. Do you long for some action with E equals mc squared? Start hanging around gamma ray photons that have some real energy, at least 200,000 times more than visible photons. You'll quickly get sick and die of cancer, but before that happens, you'll see pairs of electrons, one made of matter, the other of antimatter, just one of many dynamic particle-antiparticle duos in the universe, pop into existence where photons once roamed. As you watch, you'll also see matter-antimatter pairs of electrons collide, annihilating each other and creating gamma-ray photons once again. Increase the photon's energy by another factor of 2,000, and you now have gamma rays with enough energy to turn susceptible people into the Hulk. Pairs of these photons would wield enough energy, fully described by the power of E equals MC squared, to create particles such as neutrons, protons, and their antimatter partners, each nearly 2,000 times the mass of an electron. High energy photons don't hang out just anywhere, but they do exist in many a cosmic crucible. For gamma rays, Almost any environment hotter than a few billion degrees will do just fine. The cosmological significance of particles and energy packets that transform themselves into one another is staggering. Currently, the temperature of our expanding universe, found by measuring the bath of microwave photons that pervades all of space, is a mere 2.73 degrees Kelvin. On the Kelvin scale, all temperatures are positive. Particles have the least possible energy at zero degrees. Room temperature is about 295 degrees, and water boils at 373 degrees. Like the photons of visible light, microwave photons are too cool to have any realistic ambitions of turning themselves into particles via E equals mc squared. In other words, no known particle has a mass so low that it can be made from the meager energy of a microwave photon. The same holds true for the photons that form radio waves, infrared, and visible light, as well as ultraviolet and X-rays. More simply expressed, 
particle transmutations all require gamma rays. Yesterday, however, the universe was a little bit smaller and a little bit hotter than today. The day before, it was smaller and hotter still. Roll the clocks backwards some more, say 13.7 billion years, and you land squarely in the post-Big Bang primordial soup, a time when the temperature of the cosmos was high enough to be astrophysically interesting as gamma rays filled the universe. To understand the behavior of space, time, matter, and energy from the Big Bang to present day is one of the greatest triumphs of human thought. If you seek a complete explanation for the events of the earliest moments, when the universe was smaller and hotter than ever thereafter, you must find a way to enable the four known forces of nature, gravity, electromagnetism, the strong and the weak nuclear forces, to talk to one another, to unify and become a single metaphorce. You must also find a way to reconcile two currently incompatible branches of physics, quantum mechanics, the science of the small, and general relativity, the science of the large. Spurred by the successful marriage of quantum mechanics and electromagnetism during the mid-20th century, physicists moved swiftly to blend quantum mechanics and general relativity into a single and coherent theory of quantum gravity. Although so far they have all failed, we already know where the high hurdles lie. During the Planck era, that's the cosmic phase up to 10 to the negative 43rd power second, one 10 million trillion trillion trillionth of a second after the beginning. Because information can never travel more rapidly than the speed of light, three times 10 to the eighth power meters per second, a hypothetical observer situated anywhere in the universe during the Planck era could see no farther than three times 10 to the negative 35th power meter, 300 billion trillion trillionths of a meter. The German physicist Max Planck, after whom these unimaginably small times and distances are named, introduced the idea of quantized energy in 1900 and generally receives credit as the father of quantum mechanics. Not to worry though, so far as daily life goes, the clash between quantum mechanics and gravity poses no practical problem for the contemporary universe. Astrophysicists apply the tenets and tools of general relativity and quantum mechanics to extremely different classes of problems. But in the beginning, during the Planck era, the large was small. So there must have been a kind of shotgun wedding between the two. Alas, the vows exchanged during that ceremony continue to elude us. So no known laws of physics describe with any confidence how the universe behaved during the brief honeymoon before the expanding universe forced the very large and very small to part ways. At the end of the Planck era, gravity wriggled itself loose from the other still unified forces of nature, achieving an independent identity nicely described by our current theories. As the universe aged past 10 to the negative 35th power second, it continued to expand and to cool, and what remained of the once unified forces divided into the electroweak force and the strong nuclear force. Later still, the electroweak force split into the electromagnetic and the weak nuclear forces, laying bare four distinct and familiar forces, with the weak force controlling radioactive decay, the strong force binding together the particles in each atomic nucleus, the electromagnetic force holding atoms together in molecules, and gravity binding matter in bulk. By the time the universe aged a trillionth of a second, its transmogrified forces, along with other critical episodes, had already imbued the cosmos with its fundamental properties, each worthy of its own book. While time dragged on for the universe's first trillionth of a second, the interplay of matter and energy continued incessantly. Shortly before, during, and after the strong and electroweak forces that split, the universe contained a seething ocean of quarks, leptons, and their antimatter siblings, along with bosons, the particles that enable these particles to interact with one another. None of these particle families, so far as we now know, can be divided into anything smaller or more basic. Fundamental though they are, each family of particles comes in several species. Photons, including those that form visible light, belong to the boson family. The leptons, most familiar to the non-physicists, are electrons and perhaps neutrinos. And the most familiar quarks are, well, 
There are no familiar quarks, because in ordinary life, we always find quarks bound together into particles, such as protons and neutrons. Each species of quark has been assigned an abstract name that serves no real philological, philosophical, or pedagogical purpose except to distinguish it from the others. Up and down, strange and charmed, and top and bottom. Bosons, by the way, derive their name from the Indian physicist Satyendranath Bose. The word lepton comes from the Greek leptos, meaning light or small. Quark, however, has a literary and far more imaginative origin. The American physicist Murray Gell-Mann, who in 1964 proposed the existence of quarks, and who then thought that the quark family had only three members, drew the name from a characteristically elusive line in James Joyce's Finnegan's Wake. Three quarks for Muster Mark. One advantage quarks can claim. All their names are simple. Something that chemists, biologists, and geologists seem unable to achieve in naming their own stuff. Quarks are quirky. Unlike protons, which each have an electric charge of positive one, and electrons, each with a charge of negative one, quarks have fractional charges that come in units of one-third. And except under the most extreme conditions, you'll never catch a quark all by itself. It will always be clutching onto one or two other quarks. In fact, the force that keeps two or more of them together actually grows stronger as you separate them, as if some sort of subnuclear rubber band held them together. Separate the quark sufficiently far, and the rubber band snaps. The energy stored in the stretched band now summons E equals MC squared to create a new quark at each end, leaving you back where you started. During the quark lepton era and the cosmos's first trillionth of a second, the universe had a density sufficient for the average separation between unattached quarks to rival the separation between attached quarks. Under those conditions, allegiances between adjacent quarks could not be established unambiguously, so they moved freely among themselves. The experimental detection of this state of matter, understandably named quark soup, was reported for the first time in 2002 by a team of physicists working at the Brookhaven National Laboratories on Long Island. The combination of observation and theory suggests that an episode in the very early universe, perhaps during one of the splits between different types of force, endowed the cosmos with a remarkable asymmetry in which particles of matter outnumbered particles of antimatter by only about one part in a billion. A difference that allows us to exist today. That tiny discrepancy in population could hardly have been noticed amid the continuous creation, annihilation, and recreation of quarks and antiquarks, electrons and anti-electrons, better known as positrons, and neutrinos and antineutrinos. During that era, the odd man out, the slight preponderance of matter over antimatter had plenty of opportunities to find other particles with which to annihilate, and so did all the other particles. But not for much longer. As the universe continued to expand and cool, its temperature fell rapidly below one trillion degrees Kelvin. A millionth of a second had now passed since the beginning, but this tepid universe no longer had a temperature or density sufficient to cook quarks. All the quarks quickly grabbed Dan's partners, creating a permanent new family of heavy particles called hadrons, from the Greek hadros, meaning thick. That quark to hadron transition quickly produced protons and neutrons, as well as other, less familiar types of heavy particles, all composed of various combinations of quarks. The slight matter-antimatter asymmetry in the quark-lepton soup now passed to the hadrons, with extraordinary consequences. As the universe cooled, the amount of energy available for the spontaneous creation of particles declined continuously. During the Hadron era, photons could no longer invoke E equals MC squared to manufacture quark-antiquark pairs. Their E could not cover the pairs MC squared. In addition, the photons that emerged from all the remaining annihilations continued to lose energy to the ever-expanding universe so their energies eventually fell below the threshold required to create hadron-antihadron pairs. Every billion annihilations left a billion photons in their wake, and only a single hadron survived. Mute testimony to the tiny excess of matter over antimatter in the early universe. Those lone hadrons 
would ultimately get to have all the fun that matter can enjoy. They would provide the source of galaxies, stars, planets, and people. Without the imbalance of a billion and one to a mere billion between matter and antimatter particles, all the mass in the universe, except for the dark matter, whose form remains unknown, would have annihilated before the universe's first second had passed, leaving a cosmos in which we could see, if we had existed, photons and nothing else. The ultimate let there be light scenario. By now, one second of time has passed. At one billion degrees, the universe remains piping hot, still able to cook electrons, which, along with their positron, antimatter counterparts, continue to pop in and out of existence. But within the ever-expanding, ever-cooling universe, their days, seconds really, are numbered. What was formerly true for hadrons now comes true for electrons and positrons. They annihilate each other, and only one electron in a billion emerges, the lone survivor of the matter-antimatter suicide pact. The other electrons and positrons died to flood the universe with a greater sea of photons. With the era of electron-positron annihilation over, the cosmos has frozen into existence one electron for every proton. As the cosmos continues to cool, with its temperature falling below 100 million degrees, its protons fuse with other protons and with neutrons, forming atomic nuclei and hatching a universe in which 90% of these nuclei are hydrogen and 10% are helium, along with relatively tiny numbers of deuterium, tritium, and lithium nuclei. Two minutes have now passed since the beginning. Not for another 380,000 years does much happen to our particle soup of hydrogen nuclei, helium nuclei, electrons, and photons. Throughout these hundreds of millennia, the cosmic temperature remains sufficiently hot for the electrons to roam free among the photons, batting them to and fro. As we will shortly detail in Chapter 3, this freedom comes to an abrupt end when the temperature of the universe falls below 3,000 degrees Kelvin, about half the temperature of the Sun's surface. Right about now, all the electrons acquire orbits around the nuclei, forming atoms. The marriage of electrons with nuclei leaves the newly formed atoms within a ubiquitous bath of visible light photons, completing the story of how particles and atoms formed in the primordial universe. As the universe continues to expand, its photons continue to lose energy. Today, in every direction astrophysicists look, they find a cosmic fingerprint of microwave photons at a temperature of 2.73 degrees which represents a thousand-fold decline in the photon's energies since the time atoms first formed. The photon's patterns on the sky, the exact amount of energy that arrives from different directions, retain a memory of the cosmic distribution of matter just before atoms formed. From these patterns, astrophysicists can obtain remarkable knowledge, including the age and shape of the universe. Even though atoms now form part of daily life in the universe, Einstein's equation still has plenty of work to do, and particle accelerators, where matter-antimatter particle pairs are created routinely from energy fields, and the core of the Sun, where 4.4 million tons of matter are converted into energy every second, and in the cores of all other stars. E equals mc squared also manages to apply itself near black holes, just outside their event horizons, where particle-antiparticle pairs can pop into existence at the expense of the black hole's formidable gravitational energy. The British cosmologist, Stephen Hawking, first described the hijinks in 1975, showing that the entire mass of a black hole can slowly evaporate by this mechanism. In other words, black holes are not entirely black. The phenomenon is known as Hawking radiation and serves as a reminder of the continued fertility of Einstein's most famous equation. But what happened before all this cosmic fury? What happened before the beginning? Astrophysicists have no idea. Rather, our most creative ideas have little or no grounding in experimental science. Yet, the religious faithful tend to assert, often with a tinge of smugness, that something must have started it all. A force greater than all others. A source from which everything issues. A prime mover. In the mind of such a person, that something is, of course, God, 
whose nature varies from believer to believer, but who always bears the responsibility for starting the ball rolling. But what if the universe was always there, in a state or condition that we have yet to identify? A multiverse, for example, in which everything we call the universe amounts to only a tiny bubble in an ocean of suns? Or what if the universe, like its particles, just popped into existence from nothing we could see? These rejoinders typically satisfy no one. Nonetheless, they remind us that informed ignorance provides the natural state of mind for research scientists at the ever-shifting frontiers of knowledge. People who believe themselves ignorant of nothing have neither looked for nor stumbled upon the boundary between what is known and unknown in the cosmos. And therein lies a fascinating dichotomy. The universe always was, it's no respect as a legitimate answer to what was around before the beginning. But for many religious people, the answer, God always was, is the obvious and pleasing answer to what was around before God. No matter who you may be, engaging yourself in the quest to discover where and how everything began can induce emotional fervor, as if knowing our beginnings would bestow upon you some form of fellowship with or perhaps governance over all that comes later. So what is true for life itself is true for the universe. Knowing where you came from is no less important than knowing where you are going. Chapter 2 Antimatter Matters Particle physicists have won the contest for the most peculiar yet playful jargon of all the physical sciences. Where else could you find a neutral vector boson exchanged between a negative muon and a muon neutrino? Or a gluon exchange binding together a strange quark and a charmed quark? And where else can you meet squarks, photinos, and gravitinos? Alongside these seemingly countless particles with peculiar names, particle physicists must contend with a parallel universe of antiparticles, collectively known as antimatter. Despite its persistent appearance in science fiction stories, antimatter is real. And, as you might suppose, it does tend to annihilate upon contact with ordinary matter. The universe reveals a peculiar romance between antiparticles and particles. They can be born together out of pure energy, and they can annihilate as they reconvert their combined mass back into energy. In 1932, the American physicist Carl David Anderson discovered the anti-electron, the positively charged antimatter counterpart to the negatively charged electron. Since then, particle physicists have routinely made antiparticles of all varieties in the world's particle accelerators, but only recently have they assembled antiparticles into whole atoms. Since 1996, an international group led by Walter Uhrlert of the Institute for Nuclear Physics Research in Munich, Germany, has created atoms of antihydrogen in which an anti-electron happily orbits an anti-proton. To make these first anti-atoms, the physicist used the giant particle accelerator, operated by the European Organization for Nuclear Research, better known by its French acronym, CERN, in Geneva, Switzerland, where so many important contributions to particle physics have occurred. The physicists use a simple creation method. Make a bunch of anti-electrons and a bunch of anti-protons, bring them together at a suitable temperature and density, and wait for them to combine to form atoms. During their first round of experiments, Urlert's team produced nine atoms of antihydrogen. But in a world dominated by ordinary matter, life as an antimatter atom can be precarious. The antihydrogen atoms survived for less than 40 nanoseconds, 40 billionths of a second, before annihilating with ordinary atoms. The discovery of the anti-electron was one of the great triumphs of theoretical physics for its existence had been predicted just a few years earlier by the British-born physicist Paul A. M. Dirac. To describe matter on the smallest size scales, those of atomic and subatomic particles, physicists developed a new branch of physics during the 1920s to explain the results of their experiments with these particles. Using newly established rules, now known as quantum theory, Dirac postulated from a second solution to his equation that a phantom electron from the other side might occasionally pop into the world as an ordinary electron, leaving behind a gap or hole in the sea of negative energies. Although Dirac hoped to explain protons in this way, 
other physicists suggested that this hole would reveal itself experimentally as a positively charged anti-electron, which had come to be known as a positron for its positive electric charge. The detection of actual positrons confirmed Dirac's basic insight and established antimatter as worthy of as much respect as matter. Equations with double solutions are not unusual. One of the simplest examples answers the question, what number times itself equals nine? Is it three or negative three? Of course, the answer is both, because three times three equals nine and negative three times negative three equals nine. Physicists cannot guarantee that all the solutions of an equation correspond to events in the real world, but if a mathematical model of a physical phenomenon is correct, manipulating its equations can be as useful as, and somewhat easier than, manipulating the entire universe. As with Dirac and antimatter, such steps often lead to verifiable predictions. If the predictions prove incorrect, then the theory is discarded. But regardless of the physical outcome, a mathematical model ensures that the conclusions you may draw from it are both logical and internally consistent. Subatomic particles have many measurable features, of which mass and electric charge rank among the most important. Except for the particle's mass, which is always the same for a particle and its antiparticle, the specific properties of each type of antiparticle will always be precisely opposite to those of the particle for which it provides the anti. For example, the positron has the same mass as the electron, but the positron has one unit of positive charge, while the electron has one unit of negative charge. Similarly, the antiproton provides the oppositely charged antiparticle of the proton. Believe it or not, the chargeless neutron also has an antiparticle. It's called, you guessed it, the antineutron. An antineutron has an opposite zero charge with respect to the ordinary neutron. This arithmetical magic derives from the particular triplet of fractionally charged particles, the quarks, that form neutrons. The three quarks that compose a neutron have charges of negative one-third, negative one-third, and positive two-thirds, while those in the antineutron have charges of one-third, one-third, and negative two-thirds. Each set of three quark charges adds up to zero net charge, Yet, the corresponding components do have opposite charges. Antimatter can pop into existence out of thin air. If gamma-ray photons have sufficiently high energy, they can transform themselves into electron-positron pairs, thus converting all of their seriously large energy into a small amount of matter, in a process whose energy side fulfills Einstein's famous equation E equals mc squared. In the language of Dirac's original interpretation, the gamma-ray photon kicked an electron out of the domain of negative energies, creating an ordinary electron and an electron hole. The reverse process can also occur. If a particle and an antiparticle collide, they will annihilate by refilling the hole and emitting gamma rays. Gamma rays are the sort of radiation you should avoid. If you somehow manage to manufacture a blob of antiparticles at home, you have a wolf by the ears. Storage would immediately become a challenge because your antiparticles would annihilate with any conventional sack or grocery bag, either paper or plastic, in which you chose to confine or carry them. A cleverer storage mechanism involves trapping the charged antiparticles within the confines of a strong magnetic field where they are repelled by invisible but highly effective magnetic walls. If you embed the magnetic field in a vacuum, you can render the antiparticles safe from annihilation with ordinary matter. This magnetic equivalent of a bottle will also be the bag of choice whenever you must handle other container hostile materials, such as the 100 million degree glowing gases involved in controlled nuclear fusion experiments. The greatest storage problem arises after you have created entire anti-atoms, because anti-atoms, like atoms, do not normally rebound from a magnetic wall. You would be wise to keep your positrons and antiprotons in separate magnetic bottles until you must bring them together. To generate antimatter requires at least as much energy as you can recover when it annihilates with matter to become energy again. Unless you had a full tank of antimatter fuel before launch, a self-generating antimatter engine would slowly suck energy from your starship. 
Perhaps the original Star Trek television and film series embodied this fact, but if memory serves, Captain Kirk continually asked for more power from the matter-antimatter drives, and Scotty invariably replied in a Scottish accent that the engines cannot take it. Other physicists expect hydrogen and antihydrogen atoms to behave identically. They have not yet verified this prediction experimentally, mainly because of the difficulty they face in keeping antihydrogen atoms in existence, rather than having them annihilate almost immediately with protons and electrons. They would like to verify that the detailed behavior of a positron bound to an antiproton in an antihydrogen atom obeys all the laws of quantum theory, and that an antiatom's gravity behaves precisely as we expect of ordinary atoms. Could an antiatom produce antigravity, repulsive, instead of ordinary gravity, attractive? All theory points toward the latter, but the former, if it should prove correct, would offer amazing new insights into nature. On atomic size scales, the force of gravity between any two particles is immeasurably small. Instead of gravity, electromagnetic and nuclear forces dominate the behavior of these tiny particles because both forces are much, much stronger than gravity. To test for anti-gravity, you would need enough anti-atoms to make ordinary sized objects so that you can measure their bulk properties and compare them to ordinary matter. If a set of billiard balls, and of course the billiard table and the cue sticks, were made of antimatter, would a game of anti-pool be indistinguishable from a game of pool? Would an anti-eight ball fall into the corner pocket in exactly the same way as an ordinary eight ball? Would anti-planets orbit an anti-star the way that ordinary planets orbit ordinary stars? It's philosophically sensible and in line with all the predictions of modern physics to presume that the bulk properties of antimatter will prove to be identical to those of ordinary matter. Normal gravity, normal collisions, normal light, and so forth. Unfortunately, this means that if an anti-galaxy were headed our way on a collision course with the Milky Way, it would remain indistinguishable from an ordinary galaxy until it was too late to do anything about it. But this fearsome fate cannot be common in the universe today, because if, for example, a single anti-star annihilated with a single ordinary star, the conversion of their matter and antimatter into gamma ray energy would be swift, violent, and total. If two stars with masses similar to the sun's, each containing 10 to the 57th power particles, were to collide in our galaxy, their melding would produce an object so luminous that it would temporarily outproduce all the energy of all the stars of 100 million galaxies and fry us to an untimely end. We have no compelling evidence that such an event has ever occurred anywhere in the universe. So, best we can judge, the universe is dominated by ordinary matter and has been since the first few minutes after the Big Bang. Thus, total annihilation through matter-antimatter collisions need not rank among your chief safety concerns on your next intergalactic voyage. Still, the universe now seems disturbingly imbalanced. We expect particles and antiparticles to be created in equal numbers, yet we find a cosmos dominated by ordinary particles, which seem to be perfectly happy without their antiparticles. Do hidden pockets of antimatter in the universe account for the imbalance? Was a law of physics violated, or was an unknown law of physics at work during the early universe, forever tipping the balance in favor of matter over antimatter? We may never know the answers to these questions, but for now, if an alien hovers over your front lawn and extends an appendage as a gesture of greeting, toss it your eight ball before you get too friendly. If the appendage and the ball explode, the alien probably consists of antimatter. How it and its followers will react to this result and what the explosion will do to you need not detain us here. And if nothing untoward occurs, you can proceed safely to take your new friend to your leader.
Chapter 3 Let There Be Light At the time when the universe was just a fraction of a second old, a ferocious trillion degrees hot, and a glow with an unimaginable brilliance, its main agenda was expansion. With every passing moment, the universe got bigger as more space came into existence from nothing. Not easy to imagine, but here, evidence speaks louder than common sense. As the universe expanded, it grew cooler and dimmer. For hundreds of millennia, matter and energy cohabited in a kind of thick soup in which speedy electrons continually scattered photons of light to and fro. Back then, if your mission had been to see across the universe, you couldn't have done so. Any photons entering your eye would just nanoseconds or picoseconds earlier have bounced off electrons right in front of your face. You would have only seen a glowing fog in all directions, and your entire surroundings, luminous, translucent, reddish-white in color, would have been nearly as bright as the surface of the sun. As the universe expanded, the energy carried by each photon decreased. Eventually, about the time that the young universe reached its 380,000th birthday, its temperature dropped below 3,000 degrees, with the result that photons and helium nuclei could permanently capture electrons, thus bringing atoms into the universe. In previous epochs, every photon had sufficient energy to break apart a newly formed atom. But now the photons have lost this ability, thanks to the cosmic expansion. With fewer unattached electrons to gum up the works, the photons could finally race through space without bumping into anything. That's when the universe became transparent, the fog lifted, and a cosmic background of visible light was set free. That cosmic background persists to this day, the remnant of leftover light from a dazzling, sizzling early universe. It's a ubiquitous bath of photons, acting as much like waves as they do like particles. Each photon's wavelength equals the separation between one of its wiggly wave crests and the next, a distance you could measure with a ruler, if you could get your hands on a photon. All photons travel at the same speed in a vacuum, 186,000 miles per second, naturally called the speed of light, so photons with shorter wavelengths have a larger number of wave crests passing a particular point each second. Shorter wavelength photons therefore pack more wiggles into a given interval of time, so will have higher frequencies, more wiggles per second. Each photon's frequency provides a direct measure of its energy. The higher the photon frequency, the more energy that photon carries. As the cosmos cooled, photons lost energy to the expanding universe. The photons born in the gamma ray and X-ray parts of the spectrum morphed into ultraviolet, visible light, and infrared photons. As their wavelengths grew larger, they became cooler and less energetic, but they never stopped being photons. Today, 13.7 billion years after the beginning, the photons of the cosmic background have shifted down the spectrum to become microwaves. That's why astrophysicists call it the cosmic microwave background, though a more enduring name is the cosmic background radiation or CBR. 100 billion years from now, when the universe has expanded and cooled some more, future astrophysicists will describe the CBR as the cosmic radio wave background. The temperature of the universe drops as the size of the universe grows. It's a physical thing. As different parts of the universe move apart, the wavelengths of the photons in the CBR must increase. The cosmos stretches these waves within the spandex fabric of space and time. Because every photon's energy varies in inverse proportion to its wavelength, all the free-traveling photons will lose half their original energy for every doubling in size of the cosmos. All objects with temperatures above absolute zero will radiate photons throughout all parts of the spectrum. But that radiation always has a peak somewhere. The peak energy output of an ordinary household light bulb lies in the infrared part of the spectrum, which you can detect as warmth on your skin. Of course, light bulbs also emit plenty of visible light, or we wouldn't buy them. So you can feel the lamp's radiation as well as see it. The peak output of the cosmic background radiation occurs at a wavelength of about one millimeter, smack dab in the microwave part of the spectrum. The static that you hear on the walkie-talkie comes from an ambient bath of microwaves, 
a few percent of which are from the CBR. The rest of the noise comes from the sun, cell phones, police radar guns, and so on. Besides peaking in the microwave region, the CBR also contains some radio waves, which allow it to contaminate Earth-based radio signals, and a vanishingly small number of photons with energies higher than those of microwaves. The Ukrainian-born American physicist George Gamow and his colleagues predicted the existence of the CBR during the 1940s, consolidating their efforts in a 1948 paper that applied the then-known laws of physics to the strange conditions of the early universe. The foundation for their ideas came from the 1927 paper by Georges Edouard Lemaitre, a Belgian astronomer and Jesuit priest, now generally recognized as the father of Big Bang cosmology. But two U.S. physicists, Ralph Alpher and Robert Herman, who had previously collaborated with Gamow, first estimated what the temperature of the cosmic background ought to be. In hindsight, Alpher, Gamow, and Herman had what today seems a relatively simple argument, one which we have already made. The fabric of space-time was smaller yesterday than it is today, and since it was smaller, basic physics requires that it was hotter. So the physicists turn back the clock to imagine the epoch we have described, the time when the universe was so hot that all its atomic nuclei were laid bare because photon collisions knocked all electrons loose to roam freely through space. Under those conditions, Alpha and Herman hypothesized, photons could not have sped uninterrupted across the universe as they do today. The photon's current free ride requires that the cosmos grew sufficiently cool for the electrons to settle into orbits around the atomic nuclei. This formed complete atoms and allowed light to travel without obstruction. Although Gamow had the crucial insight that the early universe must have been much hotter than our universe today, Alpha and Herman were the first to calculate what its temperature would be today. Five degrees Kelvin. Yes, they got the number wrong. The CBR actually has a temperature of 2.73 degrees Kelvin. But these three guys nevertheless performed a successful extrapolation back into the depths of long vanished cosmic epochs. As great a feat as any other in the history of science, to take some basic atomic physics from a slab in the lab and to deduce from it the largest scale phenomenon ever measured, the temperature history of our universe ranks as nothing short of mind-blowing. Assessing this accomplishment, J. Richard Gott III, an astrophysicist at Princeton University wrote in Time Travel in Einstein's Universe, predicting that the radiation existed and then getting its temperature correct to within a factor of two was a remarkable accomplishment, rather like predicting that a flying saucer 50 feet in width would land on the White House lawn and then watching one 27 feet in width actually show up. When Gamow, Alpha, and Herman made their predictions, Physicists were still undecided about the story of how the universe began. In 1948, the same year that Alfred and Herman's paper appeared, a rival steady-state theory of the universe appeared in two papers published in England, one co-authored by the mathematician Herman Bondi and the astrophysicist Thomas Gold, the other by the cosmologist Fred Hoyle. The steady-state theory requires that the universe, though expanding, has always looked the same, a hypothesis with a deeply attractive simplicity. But because the universe is expanding, and because a steady state universe would not have been any hotter or denser yesterday than today, the Bondi Gold Hoyle scenario maintained that matter continuously pops into our universe at just the right rate to maintain a constant average density in the expanding cosmos. In contrast, the Big Bang Theory, given its name and scorn by Fred Hoyle, requires that all matter come into existence at one instant, which some find more emotionally satisfying. Notice that the steady-state theory takes the issue of the origin of the universe and throws it backward an infinite distance in time. Highly convenient for those who would rather not examine this thorny problem. The prediction of the cosmic background radiation amounted to a shot across the bow of the steady-state theorists. The CBR's existence would clearly demonstrate that the universe was once far different, much smaller and hotter than the way we find it today. The first direct observations of the CBR therefore put the first nails in the coffin of the steady state theory, though Fred Hoyle 
never fully accepted the CBR as disproving his elegant theory, going to his grave attempting to explain the radiation as arising from other causes. In 1964, the CBR was inadvertently and serendipitously discovered by Arno Penzias and Robert Wilson at the Bell Telephone Laboratories, Bell Labs for short, in Murray Hill, New Jersey. Little more than a decade later, Penzias and Wilson received the Nobel Prize for their good luck and hard work. What led Penzias and Wilson to their Nobel Prize? During the early 1960s, physicists all knew about microwaves, but almost no one had created the capability of detecting weak signals in the microwave portion of the spectrum. Back then, most wireless communication, e.g. receivers, detectors, and transmitters, rode on radio waves, which have longer wavelengths than microwaves. For these, scientists needed a shorter wavelength detector and a sensitive antenna to capture them. Bell Labs had one a king-size, horn-shaped antenna that could focus and detect microwaves as well as any apparatus on Earth. If you're going to send or receive a signal of any kind, you don't want other signals to contaminate it. Penzias and Wilson were trying to open up a new channel of communication for Bell Labs, so they wanted to pin down how much contaminating background interference these signals would experience. From the sun, from the center of the galaxy, from terrestrial sources, from whatever. They therefore embarked on a standard, important, and entirely innocent measurement aimed at establishing how easily they could detect microwave signals. Though Penzias and Wilson had some astronomy background, they were not cosmologists, but technophysicists studying microwaves, unaware of the predictions made by Gamow, Alpha, and Herman. What they were decidedly not looking for was the cosmic microwave background. So they ran their experiment and corrected their data for all known sources of interference. But they found background noise in the signal that didn't go away, and they couldn't figure out how to get rid of it. The noise seemed to come from every direction above the horizon, and it didn't change with time. Finally, they looked inside their giant horn. Pigeons were nesting there, leaving a white, dielectric substance, pigeon poop, everywhere nearby. Things must have been getting desperate for Penzias and Wilson. Could the droppings, they wondered, be responsible for the background noise? They cleaned it up, and sure enough, the noise dropped a bit. But it still wouldn't go away. The paper they published in 1965 in the Astrophysical Journal refers to the persistent puzzle of an inexplicable excess antenna temperature rather than the astronomical discovery of the century. While Penzias and Wilson were scrubbing bird droppings from their antenna, a team of physicists at Princeton University, led by Robert H. Dickey, was building a detector specifically designed to find the CBR that Gamow, Alpha, and Herman had predicted. The professors, however, lacked the resources of Bell Labs, so their work proceeded more slowly. The moment that Dickey and his colleagues heard about Penzias and Wilson's results, they knew that they'd been scooped. The Princeton team knew exactly what the excess antenna temperature was. Everything fit the theory. The temperature, the fact that the signal came from all directions in equal amounts, and that it wasn't linked in time with Earth's rotation or Earth's position in orbit around the Sun. But why should anybody accept the interpretation? For good reason. Photons take time to reach us from distant parts of the cosmos, so we inevitably look back in time whenever we look outward into space. This means that if the intelligent inhabitants of a galaxy far, far away measured the temperature of the cosmic background radiation for themselves long before we managed to so do, they should have found its temperature to be greater than 2.73 degrees Kelvin because they would have inhabited the universe when it was younger, smaller, and hotter than it is today. Can such an audacious assertion be tested? Yup. Turns out that the compound of carbon and nitrogen, called cyanogen, best known to convicted murderers as the active ingredient of the gas administered by their executioners, will become excited by exposure to microwaves. If the microwaves are warmer than the ones in our CBR, they will excite the molecule a little more effectively than our microwaves do. The cyanogen compounds thus act as a cosmic thermometer. When we observe them in distant and thus younger galaxies, 
they should find themselves bathed in a warmer cosmic background than the cyanogen in our Milky Way galaxy. In other words, those galaxies ought to live more excited lives than we do. And they do. The spectrum of cyanogen in distant galaxies shows the microwaves to have just the temperature we expect at these earlier cosmic times. You can't make this stuff up. The CBR does far more for astrophysicists than to provide direct evidence for a hot early universe, and thus for the Big Bang model. It turns out that the details of the photons that comprise the CBR reach us laden with information about the cosmos both before and after the universe became transparent. We have noted that until that time, about 380,000 years after the Big Bang, the universe was opaque. So you couldn't have witnessed matter making shapes even if you'd been sitting front row center. You couldn't have seen where galaxy clusters were starting to form. Before anybody anywhere could see anything worth seeing, photons had to acquire the ability to travel unimpeded across the universe. When the time was right, each photon began its cross-cosmos journey at the point where it smacked into the last electron that would ever stand in its way. As more and more photons escaped without being deflected by electrons, thanks to electrons joining nuclei to form atoms, they created an expanding shell of photons that astrophysicists call the surface of last scatter. That shell, which formed during a period of about 100,000 years, marks the epoch when almost all the atoms in the cosmos were born. By then, matter in large regions of the universe had already begun to coalesce. Where matter accumulates, gravity grows stronger, enabling more and more matter to gather. Those matter-rich regions seeded the formation of galaxy superclusters, while other regions remained relatively empty. The photons that last scattered off electrons within the coalescing regions developed a different, slightly cooler spectrum as they climbed out of the strengthening gravity field, which robbed them of a bit of energy. The CBR indeed shows spots that are slightly hotter or slightly cooler than average, typically by about one hundred thousandth of a degree. These hot and cool spots mark the earliest structures in the cosmos, the first clumping together of matter. We know what matter looks like today because we see galaxies, galaxy clusters, and galaxy superclusters. To figure out how those systems arose, we probe the cosmic background radiation, a remarkable relic from the remote past still filling the entire universe. Studying the patterns in the CBR amounts to a kind of cosmic phrenology. We can read the bumps on the skull of the youthful universe, and from them, deduce behavior not only for an infant, but also for a grown-up. By adding other observations of the local and the distant universe, astronomers can determine all kinds of fundamental cosmic properties from the CBR. Compare the distribution of sizes and temperatures of the slightly warmer and cooler areas, for instance, and we can infer the strength of gravity in the early universe, and thus how quickly matter accumulated. From that, we can then deduce how much ordinary matter, dark matter, and dark energy the universe comprises. Their percentages are 4, 23, and 73, respectively. From there, it's easy to tell whether or not the universe will expand forever, and whether or not the expansion will slow down, or speed up as time passes. Ordinary matter is what everyone is made of. It exerts gravity, and can absorb, emit, and otherwise interact with light. Dark matter, as we'll see in Chapter 4, is a substance of unknown nature that produces gravity but does not interact with light in any known way. And dark energy, as we'll see in Chapter 5, induces an acceleration of the cosmic expansion, forcing the universe to expand more rapidly than it otherwise would. The phrenology exam now says the cosmologists understand how the early universe behaved, but that most of the universe, then and now, consists of stuff they're clueless about. Profound areas of ignorance notwithstanding, today, as never before, cosmology has an anchor. The CBR carries the imprint of a portal through which all of us once passed. The discovery of the cosmic microwave background added new precision to cosmology by verifying the conclusion, originally derived from observations of distant galaxies, 
that the universe has been expanding for billions of years. It was the accurate and detailed map of the CBR, a map first made for small patches of the sky using balloon-borne instruments and a telescope at the South Pole, and then for the entire sky by a satellite called the Wilkinson Microwave Anisotropy Probe, WMAP, that secured cosmology's place at the table of experimental science. We shall hear much more from WMAP, whose first results appeared in 2003, before our cosmological tale is done. Cosmologists have plenty of ego. How else could they have the audacity to deduce what brought the universe into being? But the new era of observational cosmology may call for a more modest, less freewheeling stance among its practitioners. Each new observation, each morsel of data, can be good or bad for your theories. On the one hand, the observations provide a basic foundation for cosmology, a foundation that so many other sciences can take for granted because they achieve rich streams of laboratory observations. On the other hand, new data will almost certainly dispatch some of the tall tales that theorists dreamed up when they lacked the observations that would give them thumbs up or down. No science achieves maturity without precision data. Cosmology? has now become precision science.